Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Lewis. I'm an architect, uh, fellow in the American Institute of Architects, and currently president of the AIA Architects Foundation Board. The Architects Foundation Board is, the, the Architects Foundation, rather, is the philanthropic partner of the Institute. We stand next to the AIA and satisfy a number of their requirements through our 501c3, primarily administering seven or so different scholarship programs, an international prize uh, for between the French and the United States Historic Preservation Architects called the Richard Morris Hunt Prize. And also, in a sort of strange twist, we are stewards and owners of the Octagon Building, the historic building that sits proudly on the corner of where AI headquarters is located. I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to um, the inaugural event in a speaker series titled Revealing Parallel Histories Hidden in Plain Sight. And just a word about how that came to be, and it is so timely, and our guests today are just like made for this initiative, or my initiative is made for them. I don't know, it works both ways. But um, for the several years as I was on the board, we would tour through the Octagon Building, and we were shown the quarters where President Madison lived after the White House had been burned in 1812. And we were shown a table where a significant treaty had been signed. And then we would go down to the basement of the Octagon, and we would see what were formerly slave quarters. And I would sort of innocently ask about some of those stories, and they did not really exist. And this notion started brewing in my head. And finally, I guess, coincident with my term as president, which began about two years ago, I elevated those questions among us, and we agreed that having a series that would attempt to tell those stories and round out the entire history, half of which we are all accustomed to through our own educations, would be a worthy and worthwhile endeavor. I don't think we realized at the time how timely it would be in our post-George Floyd time frame where many of the things that many of us who've always been advocates for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion have said all of our careers and our lives are now being listened to a little bit differently with greater interest and greater attention. So before I turn it over to our esteemed guests, Andrew Feiler and Brent Legs, I just want to give a couple of framing remarks that will allow them to tell their story and try to bring it back and connect those dots to this theme. Um, I became aware of Andrew and his work through an exhibit that was mounted in the Octagon about his first book, I believe first, um, that did a photo chronology of the Morris Brown College in Atlanta. And from the time the, the college went into bankruptcy in 2012, Andrew began shooting this project for about a year and finished his book in 2013. And the photographs are haunting, but at once evocative of what energy must have existed in those spaces. And so I immediately became, as a photographer myself, an admirer of his work. Brent, on the other hand, um, Brent Legs, I became aware of when he applied for the Loeb Fellowship at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design and I was fortunate to be on the selection committee um, and saw this application and, you know, as a black man on that panel, uh, was compelled to want to be his advocate and to my relief, uh, I did not have to be because everyone basically rallied around this notion and Brent became a Loeb Fellow in 2012, I believe. Um, since then, uh, we've collaborated a number of times, uh, convened a Mayor's Institute on City Design down in Birmingham, Alabama, Brent was part of that and always this thread of the importance of our histories um, to know who we were, who we are, and where we're going in the future. So I want to acknowledge, before I turn it over, um, the good work of the Foundation staff, Marcy Reed, Amanda Ferrario, Amanda Malloy, uh, others who worked tirelessly to um, make us relevant, keep us relevant. Want to acknowledge the sponsorship from the National Building Museum, and also from, I'm sorry, Dominic Mann Visuals, our photographer who's giving us a real break on this event today. Appreciate you. 
Um, let me call up to the stage Brent and Andrew and begin this conversation. You have pink index cards on your tables. If you have a question that you'd like to raise, please write it on the cards. They'll be collected and sorted. And at the end, I'll come back up and curate a period of Q&A. Um, and hopefully, we'll have time to get to all of these things. But in the meantime, we're in for quite a treat. Couldn't have asked for a more aligned uh, subject to kick off our series. So welcome, gentlemen. So let me, let me start with um, two thank yous. Uh, Marcy Reed and the Architects Foundation are one of the sponsors of this book and are acknowledged uh, in the opening of the book. Uh, this book came out in, ostensibly it came out April 1st of 2021. In fact, I had early experience what we all now know is the supply chain crisis. It was stuck in the port of LA. And I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and I had told the folks at my publisher, do not bring these books through, they're printed in China, do not bring these books through the port of LA. It is famously inefficient, it is famously complex, and, it, it, and I don't know anybody in LA. If it gets stuck in the port of Savannah, I know who to call. Well, it got stuck in the port of LA and actually, so the official pub date got moved to May 1st, even though we started talking about this book on April 1st. Uh, but this book has been a bit of a sensation. Uh, it was uh, featured in a double page, this exquisite double page spread in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was featured in Smithsonian Magazine. These are kind of life milestones for a photographer. And uh, this book is in its third printing. And the exhibition that accompanies this book is now traveling the country and it's currently up through the end of the year at the National Civil Rights Museum at Lorraine Motel in Memphis. Uh, and this is the last thing I'll say by means of introduction that you start down journeys like this and you're never sure exactly where they're going to lead. But one of the great uh, aspects of my Rosenwald School experience was the opportunity to collaborate and work with Brent Legs. So it's great to be able to share the podium with Brent today. Um, I'm gonna start with two premises. The Rosenwald Schools program is one of the most transformative developments of the first half of the 20th century in America. It dramatically reshapes the United States. It dramatically transforms the African-American experience. And yet it remains hidden history. And its scope and sweep is largely unknown. The second premise is that the relationship between Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington is one of the earliest collaborations between blacks and Jews in what later becomes known as civil rights. And there's a direct connection between the collaboration of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, the friendship of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, Dr. King and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching arm in arm with Dr. Heschel's white beard flowing, and who famously says that when he marched with Dr. King, it felt like his feet were praying. And what happened in Georgia exactly two years ago, where filmmaker John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock crisscross the state of Georgia together for two months in a runoff, developing not just a political alliance, but deep personal friendship. And Georgia sends its first Jewish American and its first African American to the United States Senate. And of course, last night, after a month of Senator Ossoff and Senator Warnock campaigning together, Georgia sends Raphael Warnock back to the United States Senate for a full six year term. That relationship between John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock stands on the shoulders of the relationship of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington. I'm gonna start with a photograph of a photograph. This is a portrait of Julius Rosenwald that hangs on the wall of the Noble Hill School in Bartow County, Georgia. Julius Rosenwald is born to Jewish immigrants who had fled religious persecution in Germany. He grows up across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home in Springfield, Illinois. If you go to downtown Springfield today, there's a four square block Lincoln Home National Historical Site where all the historic homes have been preserved. And across the street from Abraham Lincoln's home is Julius Rosenwald's childhood home. Peter Askely, who's the principal biographer 
of Julius Rosenwald told me the story that when he was re researching his biography, he went down to Springfield and he was meeting with the superintendent of the National Historical Site and he says, do you happen to know where Julius Rosenwald's childhood home was? And the superintendent says to him, you're sitting in it. Julius Rosenwald's childhood home is the offices of the superintendent of the, uh, of the National Historical Site. Now back then there was not a plaque in front of that building. Today there is a plaque. And that plaque was placed there by the campaign to create a Julius Rosenwald and Rosenwald's Schools National Historical Site. And the vision of the campaign is that there would be a visitor center in Chicago and Rosenwald schools in each of the 15 states that had Rosenwald schools. I'm on the advisory council of the campaign and in 2020 legislation cleared Congress requiring that the Secretary of the Interior do a feasibility study. That uh, comment period just ended this summer when this happens, and it will happen, this will be the first component of the U.S. National Park System to honor a Jewish American. So Julius Rosenwald rises to become the president of Sears Roebuck and Company. They didn't have the term CEO back then. And with innovations like satisfaction guaranteed or your money back, he helps turn Sears into the world's largest retailer of its era. And he becomes one of the earliest and greatest philanthropists in American history. And his cause is what only later becomes known as civil rights. And he is motivated by his Judaism. He sees America as a safe haven from anti-Semitism. And he sees that safe haven weakened by how America treats her African-American citizens. He says, I believe in America, but I do not see how America can move forward if part of her people are left behind. This is a portrait of Booker T. Washington that hangs above the mantle of the president's house of what is now Tuskegee University. Booker T. Washington, born into slavery in Virginia, attends Hampton College, becomes an educator, and is the founding principal of the historically black college originally known as Tuskegee Institute. This is a rare photograph of the two men together, printed on fabric and sewn into a quilt to commemorate the restoration of the Pine Grove School in Richland County, South Carolina, and at the rededication ceremony, former teachers, former students, and their descendants were invited to sign the quilt, and it hangs today in the restored schoolhouse. The cover of my book is a photograph of the restored classroom inside the schoolhouse, and you'll see in the back left-hand corner uh, this quilt hanging. So Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington meet in 1911, and you have to, May 18th, 1911, so just over 110 years ago, you have to remember 1911 is before the Great Migration, which doesn't begin until later that decade. So 90% of African Americans live in the South. By the end of the Great Migration, which is roughly 1970, 56% of African Americans live in the South. It's one of the largest internal displacements of people in human history. But in 1911, 90% of African Americans live in the South, and public schools for African Americans are mostly shacks with a fraction of the funding provided for the education of white children, many jurisdictions do not even have public schools for African Americans. And so in 1912, these two men create this program that becomes known as Rosenwald Schools. This is a photograph of students and teachers out in front of the Jefferson Jacobs School in Jefferson County, Kentucky. They reach out to black communities just like this. And they say, if you will contribute to a school, because we want you to be a full partner in your progress. And we will count as your contribution, cash, land, material, or labor. And if you will reach out to the school board, the white school board, because we want to be deliberate about creating black-white dialogue as a foundation for future progress, and these have to be public schools. While we welcome the school system's contribution at a minimum, the school system has to agree to own, maintain, and staff the school, pay for the teachers. You do those two things, and Julius Rosenwald will make a substantial contribution towards school construction. Now think about this. The black community has to contribute. This is one of the earliest examples of challenge grants in philanthropic history. The white school system has to contribute. This is one of the earliest examples of public-private partnership. Now, I'm gonna pause and just talk about these photographs for a second. The program begins with a pilot of six schools all close to Tuskegee where Booker T. Washington and his team can keep an eye on them. 
And Booker T. Washington has photographs of students and teachers, just like this, standing out in front of their schools, carrying the hopes and dreams of their communities, and he sends them to Julius Rosenwald, who writes back that he is so moved he is committing to expand the program. And photographs just like this continue to be taken throughout the entire history of the program. They become part of the visual language of the program, the visual narrative of the program. All of my bodies of work prior to this body of work were in color, but in recognition of the significance that these photographs play in the history of this program, I shot this entire body of work, not just in black and white, but horizontally because of the linearity of these, of these um, images, but also the linearity of the architecture of Rosenwald schools. And from 1912, when the Lochapoca community in Lee County, Alabama is the first community to raise the matching funds until 1937, when President Roosevelt presides over the dedication of what will become the last Rosenwald School, the Eleanor Roosevelt School, 1912 to 1937, this program builds 4,978 schools across 15 southern and border states, and the results are transformative. Now, I'll talk about transformation in a second. Let me start with a little bit of detail on the Eleanor Roosevelt School. My process is very research intensive. I read and shoot and shoot and read, and the reading informs the shooting, and the shooting informs the reading. There are 100 Rosenwald schools listed on the National Register of Historic Places. I read 50 of those National Register nomination forms, and the story I'm about to tell you comes from the nomination, National Register nomination form for the Eleanor Roosevelt School. Franklin Roosevelt, not yet president, 1929, sees a Rosenwald school in Meriwether County, Georgia. This is Warm Springs. And he reaches out to the Rosenwald Fund and says, we need more Rosenwald schools in Meriwether County. Well, it's 1929. The recession has, is setting in. The black community is unable to contribute. The white school system is unable to contribute. And so the idea languishes. 1937, President Roosevelt calls up Edwin Embry, who's running the Rosenwald Fund, and says, I'm ready for my school. Well, the formal program actually ended in 1932. So 4,977 schools are built from 1912 to 1932, 20 years. This is five years later. So Edwin Embry says to President Roosevelt, well, Mr. President, the program formally ended five years ago. But for you, Mr. President, we can make an exception. And so the white school system contributes, the Rosenwald Fund contributes, the black community contributes, the WPA contributes. And the head of the WPA is in the Oval Office to report to President Roosevelt who asks the status of the schoolhouse. And the head of the WPA tells President Roosevelt they're $1,000 short of the funding that they need. And in the Oval Office, President Roosevelt pulls out his checkbook and writes the $1,000 check that closes the gap, and later that year, he presides over the dedication of the schoolhouse. Now, you see, um, the schoolhouse is in great distress um, at the time I was shooting these images. The schoolhouse closed in 1972 and was sold to a family in the cabinet business who bricked up the windows and used it for storage. At the time I was out shooting this work, the schoolhouse was for sale, and I'm pleased to report that th through the work of the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation, the schoolhouse has been acquired, conservation easements have been added to it, uh, and now a brother-sister team are working to raise the funds to turn the schoolhouse into a community center uh, and museum. Now, I mentioned that this program was transformative. There are two economists from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago who have done five studies of Rosenwald schools. And what their data shows is that prior to World War I, there was a large and persistent black-white education gap in the South. Of course, literacy is banned during slavery. Then you have the Freedmen's Bureau schools, and that whole system is shut down with the rise of Jim Crow. That gap, that black-white education gap that exists prior to World War I, that gap closes precipitously between World War I and World War, and World War II. And the single greatest driver of that achievement, and it is an achievement, is Rosenwald schools. In addition, many of the leaders and foot soldiers of the civil rights movement to come, come through these schools. Medgar Evers, Maya Angelou, multiple members of the Little Rock Nine who integrate Little Rock Central High, and Congressman John Lewis all went to Rosenwald schools. 
So I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. I left the South after high school. I went bouncing around the world for 15 years before I decided it was safe to go back to the South. And I moved back to Atlanta in 1995. And for 25 years, I was a constituent of Congressman Lewis's. So I reached out to Congressman Lewis and asked if he would contribute an introduction to this book. And he said, you know, I'm not sure I'm comfortable writing the history of Rosenwald schools. I just know I went to school there. I said, Congressman, there are, um, there will be three other essays in this book. Uh, one by me, two by prominent African-American preservationists, Brent Legs being one of them. Uh, we will have the history covered. What I want you to do, sir, is what only you can do. Bring us into that classroom. What was it like to go to school there? What role did education play in your life? And he said, oh, I can do that. So it was on October 29th of 2019, I found myself in Congressman Lewis's Washington office, sitting with him around the round table in the middle of his space. The walls are covered with images uh, from the civil rights movement. It's been like his office was likened to a museum, working with him on the introduction to this book. And when we finished, he pronounced, it's perfect, don't change a word. And his staff had let me in earlier and I'd set up my lights. And so his, and his jacket had been drooped behind his chair and he stood up and he put his jacket on and you see there's this cancer awareness ribbon on his lapel and he says, should I take this ribbon off? I said, Congressman Lewis, I want the authentic you and that is the authentic you, leave that on. And it was exactly two months later on December 29th of 2019, that Congressman Lewis went public with a pancreatic cancer diagnosis that would take his life the next year. This is the Emory School the oldest known surviving school in Hale County, Alabama. Uh, I had never heard of Rosenwald schools until I found myself at lunch in February of 2015 with Jeannie Syriac, who had originated the role of cult uh, African American Cultural Heritage Specialist at the Georgia State Historic Preservation Office, and she's the first person who told me about Rosenwald schools. And the story shocked me. I'm a fifth generation Jewish Georgian. I've been a progressive activist my entire life. The pillars of the story are the pillars of my life how could I have never heard of Rosenwald schools? So I came home and I Googled it and I found that while there were a number of books on the topic, there was not a comprehensive photographic account of the program. And so I set out to do exactly that. And over the next three and a half years, I drove 25,000 miles across all 15 of the program states. Of the original 4,978 schools, only about 500 survive and only half of those have been restored. I shot 105 of the surviving schools, uh, and the result is this book. So I'm gonna take you inside the Emory School, and I wanna talk about the architectural language of the Rosenwald schools. To do that, I have to talk about Robert Robinson Taylor. Robert Robinson Taylor was the first African-American to attend MIT, the first accredited African-American architect. He happens to be the great-grandfather of Valerie Jarrett, long a fixture in public policy circles in Chicago and a principal advisor to President Obama during his entire tenure in the White House. Robert Robinson Taylor is hired by Booker T. Washington to be the chief architect at Tuskegee. If you go to Tuskegee's campus today, itself a national historical site, many of the beautiful buildings on that campus were designed by Robert Robinson Taylor. And Robert Robinson Taylor leads the team that lays out the architectural language of the Rosenwald schools. On the left, large, banks of nine over nine pane windows to let in lots of light because these schoolhouses would not have originally had electricity. On the right, cloakrooms so the dirty outer garments could be kept out of the education spaces and the education spaces kept cleaner. Chimneys to vent the potbelly stoves that kept these spaces warm on colder days. And toward the back of the space you see a room divider. That room divider would have had into a series of doors that could be closed off to separate two education spaces or accordion to back to create a unified space to be a community center outside of education hours. So this idea of schoolhouse as community center is baked into the fundamental design of the Rosenwald schools. And this is progressive era architecture in service to education. And this basic language persists throughout the entire history of the program. Now this is what's known as a one teacher school. This is a two teacher school, the Hope, um, the Hope School in Newberry County, South Carolina. Uh, 
James Hope was a school, state school superintendent in South Carolina, was so committed to the Rosenwald Schools program that every county in South Carolina had Rosenwald Schools. And in fact, his family all but donated, they actually sold for $5, the two acres of land for the school and the community named it the Hope School in his honor. His great nephew, um, Ron Hope, was a career army officer, retired back to Newberry County, South Carolina, founds the schoolhouse in great disrepair, and single-handedly, literally single-handedly, restores this schoolhouse. If you go today to the National Museum of African American History and Culture on the Mall, you will find from this schoolhouse six school desks, one potbelly stove, and the original sign proclaiming Hope School. This is a two-teacher school. This is a three-teacher school, the Pleasant Plains School in Hartford County, North Carolina. Now, the basic architectural structure of the Rosenwald schools was that the architecture was to be modest. That was in part to save cost. It was also in part to avoid attracting the ire, otherwise known as arson, of the local white citizenry. But there was a more specific dictate, which is that thou shalt be no cupolas. Fletcher Dressler, who was a, um, in the, uh, uh, in the um, architectural program at George Peabody College in Nashville, now part of uh, Vanderbilt, was an architectural advisor to the Rosenwald School program, and he believed that a cupola was derivative of church architecture, and on a schoolhouse, it violated separation of church and state. But this schoolhouse has a cupola. In fact, of the 105 schools I went to, three of them had cupolas. Remember, the African-American community has to contribute, and they count cash, land, material, or labor. This community wanted a cupola, they built a cupola. This is African American Community Agency in 1920 Jim Crow, Eastern North Carolina. Now, those other buildings you saw, one, two, three teacher schools, small white clabbered buildings. By the end of the program, they're building one, two, and three story red brick buildings. This is the Dunbar School in Pulaski County, Arkansas, otherwise known as Little Rock. Um, and if the art deco detailing of this building looks vaguely familiar, it's because the architect of Little Rock Central was the architect of Dunbar. And it is from Dunbar that several of the students become members of the Little Rock Nine that integrate a Little Rock Central that's one mile from this schoolhouse. Now, most of these schoolhouses were small, and as a result, um, very few of them are still in use for educational purposes today. Uh, this is one of the few. Uh, in fact, of the 105 schools I went to, only five are still in use as educational purposes. Dunbar is now a magnet middle school. I knew this was an amazing story. It was not clear to me from the beginning how you would shoot this, and I started out shooting exteriors of buildings. It's a fascinating architectural narrative, but when I found out that only half of the surviving schools were restored and that they had outgrown their educational uses long ago, that's when I realized that the adaptive reuse narrative and the historic preservation narrative were central to this story. And that meant I had to get inside and suddenly I needed permission. And that's when I meet all of these extraordinary people, former students, former teachers, preservationists, historians, and they become the emotional heart of this narrative. These are the Pleasant Hill Quilters. Um, this is the uh, Pleasant Hill School in Cass County, Texas. Three of these women had parents that attended Rosenwald schools. Three of these women attended Rosenwald schools. And LaJoyce Flanagan, who's in the center of the front row, was a teacher in this schoolhouse. Once the school closed, um, it fell into great disrepair, and these women set upon uh, to restore the schoolhouse, and they sold quilts to raise the funds to restore the schoolhouse and turn it into the community center that it is today, and these women gather on most Mondays in the schoolhouse to quilt. It's the Lincoln School in Bledsoe County, Tennessee, also now, now a community center. Notice the pressed tin that decorates all the walls and the ceilings of this schoolhouse. Another extraordinary example of the pride that this community had in its schoolhouse, an African-American community agency, in this case, in Jim Crow 1926, uh, Central Tennessee. Uh, the Denby School in the Tidewater, Virginia, 
this, uh, this schoolhouse uh, was, uh, be uh, became a church, and then the church thrived, and they added on to, uh, to the schoolhouse. And the Lincoln School in Warfield, uh, in, um, excuse me, the um, Warfield School in Montgomery County, Tennessee, which has been un undergone an unusually beautiful renovation with this portrait of Abraham Lincoln on the wall and the shadow of these iconic nine over nine pane windows that are the architectural signature of the Rosenwald Schools program. But many of these schoolhouses remain unrestored and at great risk of collapse. This is the Hannah School uh, in Newberry County, South Carolina, across the street from the Hannah AME Church, the namesake for the school. The, ha the church's graveyard has grown up around the schoolhouse, and in the kind of detail you can never make up, the schoolhouse rises on Dead Fall Road. Um, but you see, this schoolhouse is at risk of collapse. And these spaces, these places, these structures, or this locus of history and memory in a community. And when we lose places like this, we lose a, play, a piece of the American soul. And so there is unquestionably an inherent plea in this story for preservation uh, to save these remaining schoolhouses. And this is what happens when we fail. This is the W.E.B. Du Bois School in Wake County, North Carolina that it turns out was demolished a week before I got there because the structure had become unstable. Indeed, I found other schoolhouses that were surrounded by yellow caution tape or emergency fencing uh, because the preservation efforts waited too long. But as I said, the emotional heart of this story is the people that I met. These are brothers Frank and Charles Brinkley inside the K. Rose School in Sumner County, Tennessee. The portrait of Julius Rosenwald that hangs above this doorway has hung in this space since the schoolhouse opened in 1923. Brothers Frank and, and uh, Charles Brinkley both attended this school. They went to college. They went to graduate school. They both became educators. Frank became a high school math and science teacher. Frank became a middle school principal. They have four sisters, all of whom came through this school, all of whom went to college. And these six siblings have 10 children. All 10 children went to college. That legacy may not have happened without this schoolhouse. This is the Bay Spring School in Forest County, Mississippi. This is the story of Vernon Damer Sr. Vernon Damer Sr.'s grandfather had donated the two acres of land for this schoolhouse. Vernon Damer was a student in this school. And when the schoolhouse closed in 1958, the grandfather had been smart enough to build in a reversionary clause. So the schoolhouse reverted to Vernon Damer, who turned this schoolhouse into a locus of civil rights activism. SNCC met here, the NAACP met here. And Vernon Damer, who was the head of the NAACP in Forest County, Mississippi, when he drove African Americans into Hattiesburg to attempt to register to vote, he would have them park behind the schoolhouse so they could not be identified by their vehicles and harassed. Their son Dennis told me the story that on July 4th of 1964, Freedom Summer, the family threw a picnic on the grounds of the schoolhouse for the voter registration volunteers, white and black. And at 11 years old, it was the first time he had seen blacks and whites socialized together. All of this activity drew the attention and ire of the KKK. And on the night of January 10th, 1966, Vernon Damer's home, which is just behind the copse of trees on the right side of the schoolhouse, was firebombed by the Klan. And Vernon Damer stood in the window of his school with a gun trying to hold the attackers off while his wife Ellie got their children out the back door. And Vernon Damer died as a result of his injuries from that fire. This is Ellie Damer inside the Bay Spring School. Ellie Damer had attended a different Rosenwald school in Mississippi, went off to college, came back, taught in this schoolhouse. And when the schoolhouse closed in 1958, because the state of Mississippi had built a brand new, large, consolidated schools for African, school for African Americans, do the math, state of Mississippi, 1958, four years after Brown v. Board, is building new segregated schools. Ellie Damer was denied employment in that school because of her husband's activism, and she had to get a job in a school district 35 miles away, and she taught there for the next 21 years. Their son, Dennis, at the time I was shooting this work, had recently completed a project to turn this schoolhouse back into its community center roots. 
um, and, uh, and it, th it, is, it serves this community today. And the last story I'll tell you is the Hopewell School in Bastrop County, Texas. At the time, um, this schoolhouse was in the final stages of renovation. This is inside the schoolhouse. You see the model texture on the wall, that's primer. Plastic sheeting on the floor, pla the uh, potbelly stove on the right is wrapped. Uh, the photograph in the center of this image is from the 19th century. That is Sophia and Martin MacDonald. They were both born into slavery. Upon emancipation, they started raising farm animals. They acquired some land. They acquired some more land. Eventually, they acquired 1,200 acres. And when the Rosenwald Schools program came to Bastrop County, Texas in 1919, the family donated the two acres of land for this schoolhouse. Its first teacher was their daughter. One of her students was her daughter, Sophia Williams, shown here on the right, holding up this portrait of her grandparents. Her husband, Elroy Williams, on the left, went to a different Rosenwald School in Bastrop County. They both went away to college, and they came back, had, an enti had entire careers as educators in Bastrop County, uh, and they had been leading, the, at this time, they were leading this final um, effort to restore the schoolhouse, to turn it into a community center and museum. I was just there last month to keynote the 100th anniversary of the schoolhouse. It opened in 1922, um, and uh, the community purchased a copy of this print to stand in the schoolhouse. Sophia Williams has since passed away, but I can tell you Elroy is as strong as ever. Um, I found this story time and time again. Former students becoming teachers, becoming the keepers of the flame of history and memory in a community. And it's why in this particular, I came up with so many of, the, I found Rosenwald schools directly connected to the Trail of Tears, to the Tuskegee syphilis study, to the litigation of Brown v. Board. It's why I felt compelled to write a short story that goes with each of these images. So I'm gonna close on a, um, uh, before we welcome Brent to the stage, um, I'm gonna close on a personal observation. I come to this work as an activist uh, I have been very deeply involved in the not-for-profit community, the political community, and as I sought out my photographic voice, I realized that the topics I was drawn to were an extension of my civic engagement. And there's, two, there's a part of this story which jumps out at me as an activist. Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington are building segre bu building um, building schools for African Americans in the segregated South of 1912 America. That is a deeply optimistic act. That is a multi-generational act. And I find great power from this combination of optimism and long-term thinking. And indeed, for everything Congressman Lewis had been through, this was the heart of his philosophy. He would say with great frequency, be hopeful, be optimistic. Our work is not the work of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the work of a lifetime. And so I'll close this portion of our, of our discussion with the refrain of Congressman Lewis's most, most fervent call. Be optimistic, think long-term, and make good trouble. Thank you very much. Job. <laughs> right before I let these guys chop it up, how about another round? That was just jello. And as a primer, you said, Brent, when the past is blanched and distorted through lack of diversity and representation. It affects both our understanding of today's issues and our capacity to grow in the future. This is about reconstructing America's national identity. You said a lot of things, Andrew, and my heart's kind of beating strong right now, um, and a bit, bit of a tear in my eye because I had queued up some questions for Andrew and Brent, and I think they have been answered in ways that 
leave us all reflecting on this subject of parallel histories that have been hidden in plain sight and how powerful it is when they are actually revealed. So peel back some more layers and chop it up. All right. I thought that was a powerful overview and presentation. You know, I've seen you give this presentation. I love how it's evolving and becoming so much more sophisticated. But what I think is really powerful about your work in both books is how art can evoke memory. Mm -hmm. It evokes a sense of social responsibility. And as you and I have discussed several times, the role of historic preservation to uplift hidden histories. And in essence, what Steve just highlighted, I think we both share this ethos that through our practice, whether as a preservationist or an artist and activist, that we can begin to reconstruct national identity, that we can uplift overlooked histories, and most importantly, create greater reverence and respect for the contributions of black Americans to our nation. You remember my connection to Rosenwald School. I do. And I will share this with you all briefly. You probably have heard this in some of my keynotes. So I'm from Paducah, Kentucky. And when I was attending the University of Kentucky, the graduate program in historic preservation, I was invited to conduct the statewide inventory of historic Rosenwald schools in my home state. Like you, I spent a year and a half Driving around the state of Kentucky was the first time that I realized how beautiful and sublime the landscape was of Kentucky. But I discovered that my mom and dad attended Rosenwald schools. And I remember being at a school building that was being held up by a tree and I took this chance and as I entered that building and I had this multi-sensory experience with the physical evidence of our our past, and I remember coming out on the backside, and it was a beautiful sunny day, and I just started thinking about the purpose of historic preservation, and it felt like it was moving beyond that multi-sensory cultural and educational experience, but it also was spiritual and transcendent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I wonder if you also had moments of transcendence in your experience either with the community members that are champions for telling this history or just in your kind of quiet personal experience with these historic buildings. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's, a, that's really, I think that's beautifully said in part because um, you get at the heart of what is important about historic preservation and why we do historic preservation because there is a connection between places and spaces and our culture and our heritage and our soul and it is very tactile. Mm -hmm. um, one of those moments clearly came when I, I so I was um, uh, at the Hopewell School early in the morning uh, to, uh, and it was brutally cold. It was like literally like 12 degrees out. And the person who was lead, had, uh, one of the funders who had put up the money to restore the school had met me there. And he said, you can't understand the schoolhouse until you meet Elroy and Sophia Williams. And we went next door. They literally lived next door. And they beckoned us into the kitchen. And I was sitting there with Elroy and Sophia around this warm kitchen table with this brutally cold outside, learning the history of the schoolhouse. And Sophia quietly got up and left the room. And I look up and she's come back in and she's holding this exquisite photograph with this incredibly out, um, intricately carved gilt frame. And I'm like, uh, wow. And I kind of composed myself and I'm like, I know it's brutally cold outside, but can we go next door and let me, let me take your picture inside the schoolhouse holding up this photograph? Uh, that was certainly one of those moments. There's another one of these moments I had read, I do, as I mentioned, I do a lot of reading, and there's this incredible story in Isabella Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Sons, about the Great Migration, where she talks about how when migrants arrived in their promised new land, 
they would have their photograph taken mm -hmm. as the statement of arrival. So there's a Rosenwald school, you actually showed, uh, you saw it earlier, um, the portrait of Julius Rosenwald hangs on the wall of the Noble Hill School in Bartow County. And I was up there meeting with the descendants of Webster Wheeler. Webster Wheeler had left the town of Cassville as part of the Great Migration, moved to Detroit, had um, an entire career as a carpenter with the Ford Motor Company, come back to Cat when and he heard that his community had gotten a Rosenwald grant, mm -hmm. he moved back and with one other community member, the two of them built this schoolhouse. And his photograph is hanging in the schoolhouse. And I knew that that's what this photograph was. And so that's this connection of spaces and history and mm -hmm. imagery and narrative. And yeah, there was a lot of magical moments like this along the way. Yeah. For me, I noticed through my engagement of Rosenwald schools that it's deeply personal and the preservation of Rosenwald schools celebrates my family and our individual identity, but it's also part of our nation's collective identity. Mm -hmm. And what I think is powerful about the Rosenwald School story, and if we put it into the context or continuity of history, we can start with examples related to the abolitionist movement. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the African Meeting House in Boston that was constructed in 1806 on the north slope of Beacon Hill. And it's where Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison and this early example of multiracial collaboration and activism against the institution and legacies of slavery. If we fast forward, because you put the Rosenwald schools into a civil rights context mm -hmm. and I'm somewhat kind of setting this as part of our conversation. But if you fast forward in history, expand on the idea that black children in the South having architecturally designed school buildings by the first professionally and academically trained black architects literally these buildings being built by black hands and black families, and that it was foundational to creating community and that civic identity. Mm -hmm. what, what's the arc of civil rights with the Rosenwald School story in the context of this, um, in the context of abolitionist history, educational history, and then the civil rights and social just movements that we see today? So I'd say two things. Number one, there's an important foundation, which is education. Education has been the on, the, the basically the backbone of the American dream. It is the on-ramp to the American middle class, and that is a tradition that predates the Rosenwald schools. The Rosenwald schools are part of that tradition. The first publicly funded school in America was created before there was a United States of America. It dates to 1644 in Dedham, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And there's a direct connection between that commitment to public education, the Land Grant College Act, which passes in 1862, largely because of Southern secession. The South did not want this program. Mm -hmm. HBCUs, predominantly founded in the decades after the Civil War. Rosenwald schools in the early decades of the 20th century. Uh, the educational provisions of the GI Bill which transform America from largely poor to relatively prosperous, litigation of Brown v. Board, and what are we talking about today? Crushing levels of student debt, college affordability, this crisis in education, this is a more than 375 year narrative arc which is at risk. But that feeds in the other part of your question, I mm -hmm. think, which is that uh, the Rosenwald School, the educational accomplishments of the Rosenwald Schools program helped make the, soldier, the foot soldiers and leaders of the Civil Rights Movement ready mm -hmm. to pick up the baton of freedom. That the Civil Rights Movement would have been, may not have been able to happen at the moment that it happened without multiple generations of people that had come through these schools and were both educationally and economically ready to move forward. Mm -hmm. Your first book was about HBCUs. Yes. And we both have walked the grounds and the landscape 
of Tuskegee University. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I first read Up From Slavery, which is Booker T. Washington's autobiography, and I was just enthralled that a formerly enslaved man could create an institution. And then I learned about Rosenwald schools and the way that he collaborated with Julius Rosenwald, and I was even more surprised that he could create a social movement in response to a crisis in black education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's talk about the social innovation that happens at historically black colleges and universities and their contemporary role in advancing that ethic, but also filling gaps in the kind of responding to the gaps that we know are, are deeply rooted in structural racism and inequity. So education was the principal imperative coming out of emancipation. And there are these incredibly moving stories of these schools created by the Freedmen's Bureau mm -hmm. and people young and old marching for hours to get to these schools because they knew that they had to have education. And the original, the original founding um, principle of the, of, the, of the HBCUs was to educate teachers mm -hmm. because the schools needed teachers. And in fact, later the Rosenwald Fund, uh, late in 1928, the Rosenwald Fund pivots from, fun, from focusing on Rosenwald schools to focusing more on HBCUs mm -hmm. because they needed more teachers. So um, I think that that's, uh, that that's sort of one of the, the, the early principles of, of HBCUs. Of course, now we know that HBCUs are responsible for an well outside. So there were originally about 120 HBCUs. We're down to about 100. Those 100 HBCUs are 3% of colleges in America, but they represent more than 10% of African Americans who go to college, more than 25% of African Americans who earn degrees. They are extraordinarily overrepresented in generating African-American lawyers, African-American doctors, African-American mm -hmm. architects. And I think that there's something important to acknowledge that, I mean, I've had African-Americans say to me that HBCUs, their time has come and they should go away. I've had white folks tell me that. But people are voting with their feet. And as long as this is the place that folks want to attend, they become an essential on-ramp to the American middle class and the essential uh, on-ramp to American opportunity. I agree, and, and so through the program that I lead, it's called the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. It was created in the aftermath of Charlottesville, and we're fortunate to have amazing partners like Darren Walker, the Ford Foundation, Elizabeth Alexander, the Mellon, and others that have helped us to secure almost $90 million, where we have supported and invested in 200 preservation projects nationwide, established a $14 million endowment to continue the important work of the fund, and it really is a revolution in historic preservation. I bring this up to say that, that one of our pillars is our HBCU Cultural Heritage Stewardship Initiative, where we have partnered with 19 HBCUs, whether it's capital investment, or funding campus-wide preservation plans that is a guide for administrators to be good stewards of their cultural assets and their historic landscapes. I think it's critically important that HBCUs are seen as American history, mm -hmm. that they are resourced, and that they have the internal preservation infrastructure to ensure their, the longevity of their physical history. So part of this conversation today is around hidden histories. What do you think remains hidden about the Washington or Rosenwald School story or some other aspect of American history that's intriguing to you? Well, I'm going to go back to something you said earlier, and then I have a related question for you about this. Um, I think we are in this moment of American revisionism, that we have come to understand that the American narrative that we have been telling is too old, too white, and too dead. That um, it is an inaccurate American narrative. And that the accurate version of our history has to be more inclusive of African-American stories, of 
Latinx stories, of women's stories, of Jewish stories, of gay stories. And uh, I think that that attention on the necessity of broadening the American narrative is helping us uh, learn important parts of our history mm -hmm. and having simply a more accurate and more nuanced and more uh, thoughtful understanding of our history. And because we, and that is the foundation from which we go forward and make positive changes in our culture. So we have to have this more accurate version of our history. So with that, let me turn it back to you. We've talked, one of the things we've been talking about here is the linkage between spaces and stories. Mm -hmm. Talk about some of the places that the Action Fund has helped st stabilize or, self s or help save, mm -hmm. and some of those stories that you're helping to unhide. Mm -hmm. I think one good example that's related to our conversation today is, is related to Brown v. Board Sites. Mm -hmm. And we thought it was an injustice not to tell the full history of Brown v. Board, and that within our national parks, the, the historic site that's in Topeka, Kansas, associated to Linda Brown and, and the landmark U.S. Supreme Court case, it was the only one standing to tell this remarkable American story. Yet there were five other communities in four states, Delaware, South Carolina, Virginia, and DC, that were associated to the Supreme Court case. Mm -hmm. And so we worked with Congressman James Clyburn and other congressional members, and we created an affiliated sites network that now includes all of oh, those sites within our national parks, and they will forever be interpreted and managed by the National Park Service. So that's kind of preservation practice help, helping to expand the American story. I would say that uh, another example is our new partnership with the uh, Getty Foundation. So we just are completing a new pilot, three-year pilot, investing $3.2 million to uplift the overlooked contribution of black American architects connected to modernism in the 20th century. Hmm. And we will support 16 organizations and cultural institutions that steward these important historic assets. It's exciting if we think about, again, I, I like this idea that preservation reduce, reduces the gap between space and time. Mm -hmm. And if we look at the co architectural contribution of Robert Taylor, and we bring that into the 20th century, there are so many black architects that have yet to receive their recognition and do, and they have examples of their brilliance, creativity, and ingenuity that stand as markers on the American landscape. And these places must be preserved in order to tell their story. Right. What a fabulous note to bring this com conversation to a conclusion before we ask a few audience questions. It should be noted that Currently in the Octagon Building, where Andrew's exhibit from the um, former college HBCU uh, exhibit was hung, now sits the um, Say It Loud exhibit of black fellows in the AIA. Mm -hmm. So there are 100, how many, Marcy? 140. 140 m members um, who are fellows whose presence is being recognized there. So those nice. stories are being told. Two quick questions, personal ones. Andrew, what camera do you use? What lens? Um, I use a Nikon D800, uh, and I have four lenses that I basically rotate amongst depending on what the topic is. Digital or? Digital. digital. Yeah. I was one of the, I was a late convert to digital. I got drag kicking and screaming to digital. Uh, but like a lot of people, uh, I would never go back. <laughs> right, right. And Brent, I'm very aware of how many people try to call your number because they have the project that's made for your fund and yet mm -hmm. not all can be funded. Is there a, um, a particular form, form or formula for submitting a, a request? It is, we are inviting proposals as we speak with the deadline being December 19th. So anyone that is advancing a historic preservation project nationwide associated to black history can send an email to Action Fund Grants at savingplaces.org. You can go to Saving Places to read our grant guidelines, and the funding ranges maxes at $150,000. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, our colleague Drek Wilson asked the question, are there floor plans of schools that connect Taylor, Robert Taylor, 
to the architectural designs? Yes, yeah, so the Rosenwald Fund made available their architectural plans for free to anybody that would use them. They originally published them in these four-page um, pamphlets, but they found that they were so popular, they bound them together and issued a book called Communities and Schools. And um, that, they continue to be updated and reissued as late as 1948. And those plans were used to build schools outside the confines of the Rosenwald Fund. To be a Rosenwald school, you had to have get, gotten Rosenwald funding. But thousands of schools for both blacks and whites were built using those architectural plans. Um, the first set of plans were the plans that were uh, developed by Robert Robinson Taylor and his team. Two of the, 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 the two, the first two plans, one you saw, the Emory School, in Hale County, Alabama, that was one of the, that was a one teacher school. And then there was a, uh, a more regional school, it was a two story schoolhouse, an example of which is in um, Wacomico County, Maryland, uh, at the Sharptown School, and that is also in my book. Wow. One of our other guests asked two, a two part question. I'll ask the second part first. Uh, if you find a Rosenwald school that is falling down, uh, but can still be saved, who do you call? We call it the action fund. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this was, when I was conducting the, the research, I met so many preservationists who were working with nickels and dimes. They did not have the technical expertise. They were newcomers to the work. Preservation is sophisticated. It is complicated, as you know, as a preservationist. You have to get up to speed in nonprofit management fundraising, preservation planning, uh, construction, public engagement in education, and it could go on and on. It is complicated work. You need partners that have specialized preservation expertise to guide your way and to provide that seed investment to advance the project. So I would encourage folks, reach out to the National Trust, reach out to your local and statewide preservation organizations, the State Historic Preservation Office and others, and organize a coalition around your preservation project. Let, let me just add that one of the milestones in the, preser in the Rosenwald School story, particularly the preservation of Rosenwald Schools, comes in 2002, when the National Trust put Rosenwald Schools collectively on its list of 11 most endangered places. That began a renaissance of the communities recognizing the historic resource that they had, bringing attention to the preservation uh, challenge, and then move forward in particular, the Action Fund has been one of the uh, most important forces in catalyzing communities uh, and their desire to move forward with preservation. And so there's definitely, since the Action Fund has been around, an acceleration in community-based efforts to preserve their schoolhouses. Wonderful. The other question I think you all answered very well repeatedly through the conversation, which is, you know, why do you think these stories have been hidden? But I want to talk just for a second, we don't have much time left, about books that are being banned in certain places now. Whether your book would even be allowed to be part of a library in certain schools in certain states. Are we going backwards at the same time we're going forwards? Well, my, my answer would be this. We talked earlier about how we are at this moment of American revisionism. I see that the, this the anti-critical race theory backlash as a validation of the moment that we are in. It validates this movement to diversify the American narrative. Book banning is basically part of that backlash. Book banning is obviously a terrible idea. Uh, and so I think it is incumbent upon those of us who are on the front lines of advancing a diverse American narrative to persevere because we're on the right side of history. I agree completely. If you have a chance to read the afterword that I wrote in, in Andrew's book. Which is exquisite, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It was, a, it was a plea, it's a call to action that historic preservation is a tool for creating a more just and equitable society. Mm -hmm. and, and I think 
part of the response to the fragility that we see around critical race theory is having the physical history stand so that our forgetful society never forgets, that we are forced to remember and to reckon with the complexity and truth of American history. That's exactly right. Brilliantly said. That's amazing. Um, I'm going to indulge my cousin who has a question because he was a general counsel at Tuskegee for several years, so I'll give him the, the rights. But before, so the uh, last question that was submitted was, how do you get the book? Amazon. And um, I actually paraded the book around our ZGF offices. My colleague Otto Kahn is here with us today. Um, because I bought it to prepare myself for this conversation and I forgot all about the conversation and just got enthralled by the book as a photographer, architect. And it's just, I meant to bring it today so you could sign it for me, but that gives me a reason to see you again. Well, so let me, let me just add, you can buy um, signed or autographed uh, copy, uh, personalized or autographed copies through my website, which is andrewfiler.com. But yes, it is available on Amazon. Okay, well, I got it real quick. Daryl. more than a question. Well, one, one of the things that I observed in Alabama over a 20-year history in higher education in Alabama, and I'm an education lawyer, is, and, and, and Brent mentioned institutional uh, structural racism and inequity, and my question is going back to the original Rosenwald schools, the funding, not just the funding of the building, but the paying of the teachers, the buying of the books within those school systems in Kentucky, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, etc. cetera. I, I suspect back then there was structural racism and inequity in funding so that black teachers in the Rosenwald schools were not paid the same as white teachers in the same school district. That they didn't have the n same number and quality of books in the Rosenwald schools that the white public schools had. And I suspect from 1925 to recently, the school boards, those policy makers, in those areas where the Rosenwald schools were, were predominantly white and some racist people. And so I'm curious, ha has anyone looked at the policy history of inequity, uh, of, of resources and teachers and infrastructures of the Rosenwald schools? Yeah, so there's, it's a complicated history, as you can imagine. Um, but I'll, I'll add a couple of aspects to it. So first of all, why were the Rosenwald schools so small? Because the African-American community was not afforded school buses. So the students had, they had, to, they had a smaller catchment area. And, but 85%, by the time the program was over, you take, take it throughout Missouri, because it, joined the program late and only had three Rosenwald schools. So the other 14 schools, or other 14 states in the program, counties that had a school-age African-American population, 85% of those counties had Rosenwald schools. And the average number of schools in a county was five and a half. So there were a lot of these, and, and some, of these school, some of these counties had as many as 40 Rosenwald schools. And so, um, that's one aspect of how this plays out. Secondly, and by the way, Congressman Lewis writes in his introduction to the book, walking to school and seeing the school bus carrying the white children to their school pass them by. He also comments on how their school books had the names of the white children that had previously used those books uh, already written in the books, so the books were handed down. But there's another part of this story too. The teachers in black schools were black teachers, 
they taught equality. They helped set the expectation of what America was supposed to be about. And that expectation itself was also a foundation of the civil rights movement. The last thing I'd, po I'd point out is this. In the early parts of this program, the funding is predominantly coming from the black community and from Julius Rosenwald. And in fact, I was at the, um, um, one, of the, one of the five schools that I went to that is still in use for educational purposes is the Plaisant School in St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. And kind of a long story, but I had decided that the way to shoot this school was early in the morning, and it's an active school, and it was gonna be there on a school day. I figured, look, I'm gonna be out in front of an active elementary school. I better tell somebody I'm coming. So I had called the principal and told her that I was coming. And after I finished shooting, um, and it was about nine o'clock, I went in and introduced myself. She knew a lot about this school, and it was a schoolhouse where 70% of the money had come from the black community, and 30% had come from Julius Rosenwald. And she's the one who says, she marvels at this commitment. Remember, the black communities are already being taxed to pay for white schools, and they had to dig deep to pay for this, this school. And she said they worked and they strove and they did what they could to make a better life for their children because in their eyes, education was liberation. That's where the title of this book, A Better Life for, your Ch your, your, a better life for Their Children, comes from that conversation. By the end of the program, the majority of the money is actually coming from the public school systems. And that's because the Great Migration is accelerating and the South is losing its workforce. And the white leadership understands that if they're going to keep their African-American workforce, they had to provide better educational opportunities. That and the fact that Julius Rosenwald's um, contribution provided some political cover, uh, essentially the matching grant phenomena, uh, that gave them some political cover. But by the end of the program, actually the majority of the funding is coming from the public system because of the Great Migration. And I'll, I'll just say quickly, what, what you described would be a fantastic um, dissertation project. Additional research is certainly needed to understand the, the financial disparities, both on the public and, and private side, because as you described, we know they existed because we've seen that inequity in particular on the public investment side, still manifested at HBCUs today that are arguing that they are not receiving equitable public investment like traditional academic institutions. Awesome. I can't think of a better sort of question and subject to end on, and I wish we didn't have to, but we're time constrained. Gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been extraordinary. Thanks. Always a pleasure. Always. That's fun.